There was a, a plane that was coming towards Denver at one point, and uh, the pilot and co-pilot were talking back and forth, and as they approached the runway, they had accidentally left the microphone on, and so they, uh, so they actually were able to hear this in the back. But as they approached the runway, the pilot said to the co-pilot, that is a really short runway. Um, we're going to have to come in a little bit faster, uh, a little bit harder than normal. And the co-pilot said, okay. And so they started going down a little bit faster. And then as they got closer, um, he said, that is an extremely short runway. He said, I don't know exactly. We have to hit the brakes. We have to slow down as much as we possibly can. And so they slowed down the plane as much as they possibly could, putting up whatever flaps. I don't know what those things are, you know, just to slow down the plane as much as they can. And right as they came into the end, he said, we're going to have to, we're actually going to have to touch down with the nose of the plane in order for us to stop on time. And they, and they hit and they crashed. They destroyed the bottom of the plane. Fortunately, no one was, uh, no one was hurt and no one died. But as the pilot looked over at the co-pilot, they all, everyone in the crew, everyone in the, the cabin was all shaken up, and they heard him over say, the pilot looked at him and he said, that is the shortest runway I have ever seen. And the co-pilot, surveying side to side, said, but it's the longest runway I've ever seen, widest runway I've ever seen as well. <laughs> That's just a joke, right? <laughs> they didn't actually crash land. They landed us wrong. They came in the side instead of straight up, you know. Sometimes when we approach life's problems from the wrong direction, <laughs> it makes it really, really difficult, right? And we add to, uh, add to our stress, and uh, we make things more difficult than they have to be. I was down in Florida uh, at, a, at a focus conference. Have, you, have any of you guys ever been to a focus conference? You guys been to the Steubenville conferences before? A number of you have. So I was down in this, uh, this conference down in Florida, and uh, I was driving around doing a midnight uh, snack run with some of the freshmen there. I'd put all my kids in bed because my whole family was there in the hotel, and then I went out for a midnight snack run, came back at like... Uh, 1.30 in the morning, and I was trying to invest in these guys because I wasn't sure how long I'd be around there, and they might be, you know, the future of the program, et cetera, right? You know how it is. You try to invest in some of the younger guys in case you'll still be around three years from now, right? And, um, and so when I got back there, I was like, oh, it's 1.30 in the morning. I'm like, I bet you Craig's awake. So I pull out my phone. I give him a call, and, uh, and, and I say, hey, are you awake? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just hanging out with my guys right now. I'm like, okay, can I come on over? And he said, sure. So I'm like, okay. So I, I pull my phone away. Now, Craig, Craig had come to the conference. His way of coming to the conference was, uh, his experience was three years before then, he'd come to a focus conference in the same state, actually, in Florida, just across the same city. And uh, the reason he had come is someone got up over at the School of Mines after Mass, one of the students who was also working uh, uh, full-time while still taking classes. And he got up in front of everyone and said, if anyone here wants to go to this conference down in Florida, I'll pay for you. I'll pay for the flight, I'll pay for the, the hotel, I'll pay for everything, it's absolutely free, just come along with. And Craig was in the unfortunate position where, he's looking back in the scene, he's like, shoot, I don't know, I don't really want to go back to the Springs, you know, uh, am I going to go over to my mom's house, my dad's house, my grandparents' house, where am I going to stay? He's like, what the heck, I'll go down to Florida. That was his level of buy-in. So it wasn't like, yeah, go Jesus, or anything like that, you know, but it was like, Sound, sounds good enough, I, I, you know, if you make it free, I'll go. Three years later, in order to get to this conference, he went down to his church in Colorado Springs, and he presented in front of the church. He stood up in front of everyone and explained his story. He explained, three years ago, someone offered at a mass to pay for me to go to, the, to a conference, and it radically changed my life. And he said, and he went on to explain how he had grown into an entirely different person because of this experience. And he said, I'm here, to he I'm here today to ask you to give me money so that I can go back to campus and offer the same. So that I can go tell someone on campus, you don't have to pay a dime. You can come. It'll be an awesome experience. You can come down to Florida. You'll have an amazing time. It'll be a life-changing experience. Don't worry about the cost. And his church gave to him. He, he spoke at four different masses. They gave him enough where he got an entire scholarship and a half. So he's able to go back to campus and offer it to one guy who said, sure, you know, I don't, I don't have any money. I can't, just, I can't afford it. I said, sure, I'll pay for it, no worries. Another guy said, well, I can, I can afford the plane ticket if you just pay for the hotel, so you pay for the hotel. So at 1.30 in the morning, I come knocking on the door. He opens the door, and in his room is one guy, you know, uh, who he, you know the guy who got the full scholarship, another guy who got a half scholarship, another friend, another friend of his, but all these guys that were younger than him. I walk in, I sit there for an hour, and I get to watch Craig witnessing to these guys. You know, explaining life. Is they, they're having these experiences because they're, they're at the conference, right? They're, you know, they're experiencing the Lord for, in, in, in many ways for the first time. And I get to watch this guy who I knew as a freshman. I knew as this crazy, had no idea where he was going, no sense of direction. I just, I just committed to Jesus and I'm in. 
I don't know what that means, you know. And I get to walk with him throughout. I get to meet with him weekly throughout. I get to invest in his life and watching this kid that was very insecure really come into his own in a way where he understood the faith and he could pass this on to others. And I tell you, it's one of the greatest feelings I've ever had to get to witness this, to get to be part of someone else coming, not only into the faith, but so deeply into the faith that they're pulling others in too. And that's the gift that I hope you guys get to have. I hope you get to experience that at some point in life where you get to see the investment, the time, and the love you're putting into people's lives right now. You get to see that paying off. You get to see that really coming back. And you get to see the lives that you've touched And as these people are transformed and they go on to transform other people's lives. Because it's so awesome. Now here's the difficulty. I was in charge of a campus program. And is it important or not important for you to create a subculture for people to come to? Right? Dumb rhetorical question. Absolutely, right? It's extremely important, right? You have to be focusing on the culture. You have to be focusing on making sure that all the programs are running. You have to make sure your core team, you're all on pace together, right? You're all on the same page together. How in the world do you make time to ever invest in individuals? And so one of the hardest things that I've had to go through in ministry is not investing time in certain people is not in being intentional with certain people, or intentionally not being intentional, if you will. But it's really hard, it's frustrating. I don't know, how many of you feel guilty? This is an actual question here. How many of you feel guilty at times for, for the people that you are not reaching? Raise your hand. It's the normal reaction, right? It's not gonna go away. It's irrational, but we always feel guilty about it. all those people we're not reaching. If only I could reach this guy and that girl. If only, and, and, I, and I see, I, I could have that conversation with him right now, but I got to run this program right now. What do you do with that type of tension? How do you approach this problem in such a way where you're really able to look at it years down the road? Because I was there at the conference with Craig originally, and I got to mentor him along in the next three years. How, how are you able to? To be in such a way where years down the road, you're able to look back and say, look, I invested in in this guy and this guy and this guy, or in this guy and this guy and this guy. And I can watch as the fruit comes through for the rest of their lives. And so, I'm here to discourage you (laughs) from spending too much time with everyone. From trying to be there for everyone at the same degree. You have a ministry. You have an outreach. And you need to make sure the culture is such that people can come to experience the Lord. That is is your obligation as the youth director, right? You have that obligation. You have that weight to make sure things are going well, things are running smoothly, etc. That's important. But I want to give you an experience of mine. The guy's name's David. David... He started coming to my Bi- one, of my Bi- one of the Bible studies that I led and a couple other guys' Bible studies and started really coming to the faith. And then he had an internship out on the West Coast and he found the Dominicans out there. Fell in love. Absolutely felt like he was at home. The entire summer he kept talking with them, communicating with them and, and going to adoration and, and all the rest of this. He comes, he comes back. Right before he came back, he called me up and said, I want to be a student leader. With focus to be a student leader, you have to have someone to mentor you along the process. And I'm like, I'm maxed out. I, I can't possibly take this guy on. And so I ended up uh, having one of the guys that I was mentoring try, you know, try to mentor him. And honestly, it wasn't a good fit. David was an extremely intellectual person that had deep and hard questions to answer. And the guy that I set him up with, Mark, was a great guy. And he was a really heartfelt guy. But he wasn't able to really nail those questions. And so, so David really looked to me, and he really looked up to me, and really wanted me to answer his questions. I got to hang out with him a couple times. I got to you know, go over to his fraternity, walk around his fraternity, shared his testimony, his, his initial experience, what got him to want to turn to the faith and everything else. And, uh, and there were times here and there, I get, you know, after a Bible study, we talk for maybe 10, 15 minutes. Not necessarily just him and myself, but a you know, small group, like three or four guys with him included. <coughs> 
but I never met with him with any regularity. I did not invest a lot of time and energy into David. And I tell you, that was years of feeling guilty. And I had to stay the course of saying, I've got the guys that God's invested to me. He's, he's entrusted these people to me. These are the guys I'm investing in. David's taken care of. It's not a question of, you know, soul falling away, etc. But I can only invest so much and I can only invest deeply in so many people. Now, when David decided to join the Dominicans, he did sit me down and, we, and tell me for an hour and a half why he, what his process was, what his discernment was, and the joy of finding his vocation. He's there right now over in San Francisco in his novitiate. And so I've been able to be a part of his life. But the hard part is, and you probably don't get this very often, is that discouragement of, it's okay. It's okay not to reach everybody to the same degree. Because the only way to make everyone equal is to make everyone dead in society in general, right? If we want to have true, perfect equality, we have to kill everybody because there are people dying out there. We want to love everybody, but we can't love everybody the exact same way. And as Americans, I think we have built into our system a, 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 a feeling of guilt. I should. I should be able to love everyone the exact same. I should be able to go out and you know, preach to everyone the gospel and, and witness them to one-on-one and, and, and kind of go through, hear what their, what their life struggles are and what they care about and what their dreams are, what their hopes are, and help them find those dreams. But every yes has a company knows. So I wanted to share with you five points of, of discipleship, of sharing the faith with others that I found to be helpful. Because I was asked at one point by one of student leaders, or a couple of student leaders, they're like, okay, so what do we do as student leaders? <laughs> you know? like, what are we, what, what's, the, what's the goal here? What, what, what are we going for? And I was like, oh, well, okay, um, well, he, well, here you go, you know. So I was like, all right, well, I came up with, uh, I changed the acronym names. It was RFEBD, which is a terrible acronym. So this one's a little bit, a little bit better anyway, getting at the same point. So I was like, okay, so we'll go with, uh, you know, are you fed? Five points, relationship, united in community, formation, engagement, not like the ring type, but like engagement, like going for it, right? And discipleship. So relationship, entering into relationship with a person, actually entering into relationship. A lot of people want to evangelize and they don't want to know people. They don't want to know persons, you know what I mean? I can think of one particular politician that comes to mind that I think loves humanity and I don't think he likes this one single human being because he sees them as inconveniences. And I don't point the finger outward except that I have three, point, three fingers, right? Pointing right back at me, right? And it's true for me too, right? It's true for any of us. We can easily think, well, I want to go help everyone, but you know, individual persons, like, how much time do I have to invest? How about I come up with a program, right? What was the, uh, what was the phrase that Ben had? It was the... Uh, plug and play, right? We always have that tendency you want to just like set up the program that will run itself, the program that will love everyone, right? And so, so you have to start with relationship. I'll go, over the, go back over this in more in depth in just a second. Uniting in community, actually having something to bring people to, right? You need to have that. Formation, so it's not just a Jesus high uh, or a wonderful experience, but actually they're able to have their questions answered. They're able to go through and think, okay, I understand this, I understand that. I have this and that experience. I understand that Jesus is in the Eucharist. He's truly present. I can, I can understand this and explain this to a Protestant friend of mine from John 6 and 1 Corinthians 12, things like that. Then engagement, actually getting them to dive in. Once they understand, they got all this head knowledge. That's a wonderful thing, but head knowledge never saved anybody, right? Head knowledge doesn't get you there. You have to actually dive in. You have to say, yeah, I'm in. And that can come in many various ways in the various levels. And finally, discipleship is giving others the tools to be able to pass on the first four. Right, for them to actually do that with somebody else. Pass it on to somebody else. And so, so going through this, starting with relationship. That cart is so loud, that's amazing. <laughs> so relationship. Um, who do you go for? Because relationship, we need to be intentional, right? We want to actually be there for them. Step into their lives, caring for them. Who do, you, who do you go for? The first one to walk through the door? 
Just grab your it and I'm going to get to know you so well. We're going to be best friends for the longest time. It's going to be awesome. And why are you turning your back on me? <laughs> and they never come back for some reason, right? So who do you go for? So if you had a scale from 1 up till 10, I know it's not 8 dashes, but if you had a scale 1 to 10, and it was your level, the student's level of buy-in to Christ, 10 being absolutely sold out, 100%, I can't shut up. You know, I have to tell, I have to tell everyone about him. Neighbor asks, how's your day going? You're like, yeah, I can't believe he died for me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> One being like the, like seriously, uh, the Catholic Church is just out to molest boys. Cut it out. You know what I mean? Like, you know, totally, you know, wide spectrum of totally disagreement. You probably don't have as much of that. At Mines, we had a lot of that. We had some people that were really thoroughly antagonistic. I loved those people. <laughs> they were so fun to talk to. I'm guessing in youth group, it's more of a captive audience, though. You have people that are at least told by their parents they have to go there. But well, tell me, though, does it, does it run that, though? Because I'm looking at a lot of you are kind of like, actually, we have a lot of antagonistic people. Yeah? yeah? Yeah, there's a good bit of antagonism there. Okay, so let's say you have antagonistic people that are down one all the way up to ten. Who do you go for? Not a rhetorical question. What do you, you know? I think it kind of depends, but I think, uh, I mean, you could go for both sides. But I think it depends on their, like, contagiousness and their... And I guess their openness as well. I love it. I love it. And I asked this at one point to, to the student leaders. I, and I kind of set this up. And a lot of them were like, well, sevens. Because sevens are able to go out and reach others. And they're at a good place. And I was like, you go for one through ten. You go for one through ten based on what you just said. What's their openness? Because if a one is open to having a conversation. I've had a couple conversations at mine where after half an hour, someone, they, the person looked me in the eyes. Actually, it was a couple at one point. They looked at me and they said, I've never been able to talk to a Christian before that had anything but an angry response to me when I was explaining my atheistic views. I'm like, sweet. That was an awesome conversation. I just loved him closer to Jesus. You know? You can get tens right there that come up to you and they talk and you shoot the breeze and you never helped them at all and you, ne you didn't get them any closer to Jesus and they're great and you feel great about it, but you didn't do anything, right? The question I'd ask is, who can you love closer to Jesus? Just one step closer to Jesus. Because I don't think it matters where they are on this. I think it matters, as you said, their openness. Are they open to moving up? If they're, if they're really at a ten, are they, are they willing to start a Bible study in their own school? Are they willing to start a prayer group after school? Are they willing to try something radical? Because if you can help to find that thing, that kind of next step they have to go in for them to continue to grow, then your relationship with them is one where you're helping them to grow. I'd argue that sevens and eights are sometimes the hardest people to reach. Because how are you going to get them to go deeper? I like sevens and eights. I do personally. I like the people that are kind of like, I am on, I'm in. What are you in? I don't know, but I'm in. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about that, you know? We'll get you something, you know, some, some stuff to do with that, you know? I like that. I like the people that are in but don't know why yet. They're not on fire, but they're at least in. You know, they're committed. I like that. That's my preference. But that's a preference. And you'll each find you have different emphases and different preferences. That's great. That's fine. But I say, if you look at this right here, the point is to say, who can I love one step closer to Christ? And I think when you find a few people in there, there was a, a teammate of mine, when she first came on campus, I was telling her, uh, Jesus had 12 disciples and three he really emphasized on. Unfortunately, Andrew got cut out as we were <laughs> explaining earlier. Poor Andrew. <laughs> and then, and one that he set up as his Pope, right? So I'm like, well, if it works for Jesus, it should work for us, right? So let's try a 12-3-1 model. And they're like, 12 people? Like that I'm investing in? And they looked at me like, that's a lot. I'm like, just wait three months. 12 will be painfully small. And it'll be really hard for you to limit yourself to really 12 people that you're trying to, inve you know, trying to invest in and see where all of a sudden, pop, the Holy Spirit goes and you're like, yay, let's go. You're one of the three. Let's get running. And it always rotates. It's not like it's a fixed scale or something like that. But the point is to say, like, when you're first getting into this, 12 people, actually knowing well, 12 people can seem like a lot, right? But anyone here around here, I'm not getting many nods here, because everyone here has been around the block long enough to know 12 people is like nobody, Right? Only knowing 12 people is really hard to limit yourself to 12 people and not to be like obnoxious about this and not to be like, you're not one of the 12, I'm looking this way, you know? <laughs> it's not like that. I mean, the point is not the exclusivity. The point is like, the point is like you know, when, when, when these two guys come up, what's your name over there? John, John what's your name? Robert. Robert. Yeah. If John's one of the guys you really want to in, invest in, 
the point is, you know, as he comes walking up there, I'm already walking towards John. Now, if Robert interrupts and says, hey, how's it going? I'm going to talk to him. I'm not I'm rejecting him in any way. But I'm really wanting to know because John's one of the guys that for some reason, I feel like I can love him closer to Christ. For some reason, there, there's something there where, where John, for some reason, when I'm with him, he just, he just seems to get it. Whether it's intellectual, whether it's the formation side of things, whether it's just the experiential, whether it's you know, diving into the community, but whatever it is, there's something there. You know what I mean? You know that something that's just there? It's that intangible something. It's a gut feeling. It's not something you can put in a textbook. But you know it when it's there. And you're like, dude, I don't even know why. This guy is such a jerk. And I love him. And I totally want to get to know him, you know? I remember one guy in particular, um, I won't even say say his name, but he was dropping F-bombs at me over lunch, and, you know, he just cussing me out, thinking, you know, you're this, 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 that. He came to the Florida conference and had, had among others, had some, some radical conversions along the way, and, uh, and now he's solidly in the church, and he's a great, really nice guy, you know, and I, but, it, but it was like, I love this guy. I don't know why, I just love him. I just, you know, like, yeah, let's talk more, let's hang out more, you know, whatever, you know. For some reason, there's just that, that intangible connection. And I would encourage you, I mean, they're discouraging you on, on the, uh, the other side, but I'm encur- I would encourage you, though, to follow that. And to be intentional on that. And again, I have to, you know, to pick on you if you keep letting me. It's not, I don't like Robert. It's nothing against him. It's, I, for some reason, God is calling me, and he puts it on your heart, right? He's calling me towards John. Now, what if, what if the next week John's like, I, I just don't care anymore? All right, well, I'm not going to you know, be so intentional. I'm not going to always walk up to him. You know, it rotates and it switches around constantly. But when you find those people that are really excited to be intentional about it, I say do it and don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty when you find those people that can really go deep. Because what will happen, now they say the typical youth ministry. You know, you know how long youth ministry, what do you guess how long youth ministers last? Oh, everyone knows that one. Oh, that's a standard figure. 18 months, right? That's not very long. I tell you what kept me going was, was times like that I mentioned out in Florida with Craig. Those times right there kept me going. They're what gave to me. They, they what filled me up. Because you give and you give and you give. I just met with so many burned out student leaders. We would always set up one guy. Mines was quirky. So with Mines, I was never officially present at Mines. I was a friend that I was invited onto campus. I could never reserve a room. I could never have any official status. That's the way mine's rolled. It was great because all the other religious organizations had to stay off campus. We were the only ones that actually had a foot in the door. We had the biggest foot in the door. So it worked out well. It was fine. But because of that, we were, we were kept on oh, 280 HD, darn it. We were, uh, we were kept at a, a distance. I was trying to reserve rooms. Oh, shoot. Anyone take me back for a second? I was talking with... Mine's is quirky. Mine's is quirky, right? And I was talking about with Craig and he and the encouragement. Oh, yeah. So we had to set up a student leader who's in charge of everything. Thank you. Uh, we had to set up a student leader who's in charge of everything. He was the president of the student organization. He was the president. We were kind of the guests. It was kind of backwards that way, but whatever. It worked, you know. We had, we had an understanding. So um, the problem was the president would invest so much time and energy and effort into the programs that they would hate it. After eight months, I remember talking to uh, the first guy, just, you know, totally burned out. And he just, by the end of it, he was just like, oh, I'm glad to be out here, you know? Next guy, I was telling him, like, all right, Kelly, don't burn yourself out now. You know, don't burn yourself out. You know, don't take on too many administrative tasks. And he sure you know, took on too many, just the same. And, you know, and he gradually burned himself out. I'm like, what the heck? And, and I realized what keeps somebody from burning out, at least in my experience, this is true for me. One of the things that keeps us from burning out is having those encouraging interactions. Because when you're having an okay day, not an amazing day, not a terrible day, an okay day, who do you share that with? Can you share that with someone? You know, there are you close enough with someone you get to hear, you get to share your own self, or, or even more to the point, can you get that feedback that just says, yes, I, I know what I'm doing makes sense. Again, going back to the Chevetta, um, I'm sorry, uh, to the David example. Um, so David, he was in a position where it was like, I'm not reaching, I'm not reaching him. I'm getting discouraged, I'm getting discouraged. But I'm like, yeah, but I know I'm reaching Craig. I know I'm reaching Mark. I know I'm reaching Eric. I have these, he's kind of almost like a piton for a rock climber, you know? He nailed it into the rock, so if you fall, you only fall so far. In many ways, those guys and those gals for you are, are like those pitons. 
that hold you up when everything's just feeling like, what am I doing? Am I, is this worthwhile? Have I done anything since I came to this parish? It's like, yeah, but I know those people, those couple people over there feel more loved. And when you get that reassurance, that's what saves you from being burned out. And I'm proud to say the last president of our student organization on campus was not burned out. Because <laughs> Craig was the last one. <laughs> and, and when you feel invested, and it's different. But when you get to invest in somebody else, you get to see the feedback. It's so helpful. Okay, so how do you invest then? Who to invest in, right? Anyone that will go deeper. How do you invest? And this one, honestly, I have a different level, a different area of expertise than you do. So I had to call up some youth directors and ask, how do you reach teens? Because <laughs> it's not the same as on campus. Um, but through texting, through Facebook, right? Through normal interactions, simply walking up to them when they're at the meetings, being intentional, remembering their interests, whether it's the uh, romantic interest, that's always a nice one, but, but also so the sports interest is a big one too, right? If someone's huge into the Broncos, getting down all of Manning, even for the ladies, getting all of Peyton Manning statistics down is important at that point if you really want to invest in this person, right? Being able to carry on the conversation. What music do they like? You might hate <laughs> the music that they like, but if you really love this person, you're like, I, I gotta go deeper with this person. Listen to the music over and over again until you at least are not utterly repulsed by it, you know? But take the time. I remember one time my sister, I wanted you know, to get to know her better, and she had this band. I'm like, I don't like this at all. I will listen to two songs every single night before I go to bed, because then if I hear it enough, I'll finally, I might finally like it. And I did. It took some, it took some time, but I eventually started liking uh, Phantom Planet and Keen. It took a while, though. I just, I, now I like them a lot, but it, it took a while, right? You, you might not think of that as the intentional investment. You're like, I need to be with students. I need to be writing the programs. That right there is huge. Taking interest in their interests. Taking the time to just enjoy what they enjoy. That's huge. And you might feel guilty for that. You might feel like, but the programs have to be, the programs have to be good, yes. But when you can reach someone individually, you can actually like what they like, or at least know enough to discuss about what they like. You're going to reach them in a deep way. And they're going to know. They're going to notice. So we had a phrase on campus, break into their lives. So we'd, we'd call it Biddle. Again, we had goofy acronyms, right? <laughs> Biddle, break into their lives. Not all at once, slowly. <laughs> you know, as I said, when the person's first coming walking in, what's your mother's maiden name? You know, it'd be a weird <laughs> thing to ask, right? But, but when, you, when you get to know them, trying to see how can I get to know them a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. They have a big game coming up on Friday. Oh. Wait, what do, you, what do you play? I play football. Oh, okay. Can I make it to a Friday night game? Can I do this for multiple people? <laughs> probably not. Maybe three tops. Probably only about one. Can you really make that make that time and kind of time commitment, right? Because you can't just go to a bunch of football games or a bunch of plays, a bunch of soccer games or whatever. You can't do it, right? It's too much. But you can do it for a couple people, and you can really invest the time and the energy into just a couple people there and see an awesome, awesome fruit from that. So like, to give you an extreme example, which is not at all applicable because everyone lives locally, right? Here, you know, they don't come from a far, far away state. But like one of my guys, Mark, I wanted, to, I wanted to get to know him better. And I didn't do this within the first year of knowing him. But, but down the road, it was like, all right, I want to get to know your family. It's like, can I come by your, your house in Utah sometime? So we set up a trip so that on our way through, my whole family drove with him in the car through Wyoming, stayed a night at a bed and breakfast, went to his house, stayed a night there, and then drove up to Idaho where Sarah's sister, that's my wife Sarah, her sister uh, was living at the time. And then came back and picked him up and uh, they flew out elsewhere. So it was just the two of us getting an eight hour drive back together. That's an extreme example and it's not applicable to high school, but my point is just that like, because yeah, you can't do that, you can't go for an eight hour drive with them, right? <laughs> I understand. But at the same time, like to say, but what could I do? What are some of the extreme things I could do? I mean, you could even, a little crazy. You could even at some point, when the guy's just like, he's just eating it up. He just wants to know more of the Lord. He loves it that, you know, you know, that you're, you're coming to know the Lord more deeply. You can even say like, hey, can I come over to your house for a family dinner sometime? Hang out with your family. Get to know them. And I know it's like, but I, I can't do this over and over again. I can't do this with a bunch of people. But even just doing it once a year, something extreme like that, and really showing someone, look, I really care about you. And I get the chance and opportunity to love you. That's huge. That's huge. 
So, relationship, that's point number one. The next four points will take less time than point number one. Thank God, right? Because we would be falling asleep otherwise. All right, so after relationship, then you get united in community. How do you unite them to a community? How do you bring them into community? There's a number of different ways to do this, right? And one of the things, one of the responsibilities we have is creating a subculture and having individual communities and making sure that we actually have something to invite people to and to ask. But I would say, quite simply, this one I'm thinking, if you're not getting this as a youth minister, this is one of those things where everything's falling apart. Right? I mean, you have to be able to have events to invite people to. So I don't want to spend as much time on this one simply because you guys probably know it as well or better than myself. But invite people to stuff. And again, as you're passing this on to somebody else, you're passing on, get to know someone personally and invite them to stuff. So you're probably used to making this explicit uh, as well. It's trying to tell others, you know, actually go out of your comfort zone and invite others to, to stuff, to small groups, to uh, barbecue we have going on over the church, to mass on Sunday, something like that. So the third, formation. So when you're, for, when you're helping to form people, I'd say, uh, I'll give you an example instead of saying it first. There was a guy once, called him up. Again, this was mine's. I called, I called him up. I said, hey, Chris, you want to come to Bible study sometime? Uh, we got together here and there. I'd known him for about a year and a half. And he said, no, I'm not really interested. And uh, again, he's a mind's guy, right? He's just very direct, you know. Uh, and I said, okay. So if you ever have any questions about the faith, let me know. I built up enough rapport where he could, you know, fire one off. And so he said, oh, I have a question for you. And I was like, oh, this is the million-dollar question. If I don't answer this one well, he'll never talk to me about the faith again, right? I was like, okay. So I was like, oh, okay, what's that? He asked me, what's the difference between being Christian and being Catholic? He meant Protestant and Catholic. That's how he said it. So I knew I had like 30 seconds to give a really good dynamic answer or he'd never ask me a question again. And he'd write me off. I was like, whew, here's the hot seat for you, right? And so I simply said, it's the difference between, between being declared and being transformed. God says you're fine on one and actually God makes you fine and makes you into his own child. And you're, you're transformed from the inside. So they have one, they have a theology of declaration and we have a theology of transformation where God really changes us as a necessary part of our salvation. And he was like, Okay, right, well, maybe we'll grab breakfast sometime. I was like, whew, pass the test, you know? And so, I mean, like, you get, but you get those times right there where you need to be, you need to be like this with your answer, right? So as, as a resource, how many of you are familiar with Chris Stefanik? How many of you have watched his real-life Catholic videos online? Okay, good, good, good. He's got some amazing stuff there. That is an excellent resource. If any of you haven't yet, look up Real Life Catholic. He's got some great videos. He's explained so much so quickly and it's just so intense. You're like, how did you just explain the Catholic Church's view on homosexuality in a minute and a half in a way that was totally compassionate and loving and showed how this is the only compassionate, loving approach? How did you just do that, you know? But you guys, you got you to be going doing that, right? You got to give the quick answers. I remember one time, this was better than 30 seconds, I had approximately 0.7 seconds for this one. I, we'd set up a, a, a table. Again, I wouldn't recommend this. It's not transferable to high school. We'd set up a table, ask a Catholic a question. You know, we're Catholic. We love Jesus. Ask any question you want. So people would walk by, and most people wouldn't ask a question. Some people would be antagonistic here and there. And I noticed one guy who's just about to walk out the door. I said, hey, I said, hey, whatever, John, you have a question. And uh, right as he's opening the door, right as he's walking out. So that's why I had less than a second to answer this. What's the meaning of life? A little smart-ass response, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, self-donation. He looked, he's like, mm. so, yeah, you know, through the glass doors, I can still see the guy. He's like, wow, okay, you pull, pull that one off, you know. But to have those quick responses, to keep being formed well enough. Now, I'm, I'm finishing up a master's at the uh, Augustine Institute. I love it. I, I love the classes there. I love the formation there. But you don't need a master's to be able to answer necessarily the high school questions. It helps. I love the, the deeper formation. But if you're not growing at all, how can you challenge others to grow, right? We've got to be growing in how much we know. Whether it's master's level courses or whether it's YouTube videos, <laughs> one way or another, we've got to be growing. We've got to be looking for how can I get a quicker, compassionate, loving, doctrinal answer to that question. Cut straight to the heart. I was at the University of Illinois, and a woman, one, a woman asked, she said, you know, every, all the religions are the same. You can love whatever God you want. And so I said, well, if God really is a person, imagine you say, well, I love it. loving anyone else is the same as loving you. Imagine if your boyfriend said to you, well, I was sleeping with this other girl the other night, but don't worry, she's a girl, just like you. 
And she was like, she looked at me, and it was the first time I think that any Christian had ever made a point. You know, and she was just like, she's like, well, I, uh, you know, and then she kind of went off on, on something else. But it was interesting because I was actually trying to really win over the person that was next to her. It was some random door-to-door evangelization we did just to get out of our comfort zones at the time, so there's no follow, follow-up afterwards. But, but like, it was like, how do, you, how do you cut straight into that and have the formation to know how to say things correctly, doctrinally, but quickly, succinctly, and impactfully? That's a difficult thing, right? And then to have the resources to give to someone else uh, is a difficult thing. But it's important, especially as someone's going deeper, to give them the intellectual formation, as Peter as Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, I think it is, 3.15 or 3.21, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. Right? The hope that is in you. Always be prepared to make a defense. So, you gotta, so the formation side is important. Then, after formation, you have engagement. Getting someone to engage. Engagement's a kind of goofy way of saying it. Right? So one way to, uh, get, a, to get someone engaged is to say, hey, stand up. All right, so everyone stand up. <laughs> it's been a half an hour. <laughs> everyone spin one time around with your hands way up in the air. That's as close as you get to Simon Says. <laughs> All right, now sit down. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. All right, we're getting through this. We're getting through this. And I hope that when we get through this, that it's not just a, hey, that was a fun talk. I hope you take this away with some tools. And I hope you take away with the, ah, it's so hard to think of it actually being true, but investing in just a couple people deeply <coughs> is really where I'm going to see some fruit. And I hope you get to experience the joy that I've gotten to experience. I mean, the same, there, there, there are plenty of different people, but I'll, I'll list off another one. One guy picked out a Bible study, and you know, I was thinking, this guy really just seems to want to go deeper. I met with him one-on-one. Uh, I, brought, I asked him for coffee at some point. We like to grab coffee. You know, and, um, and you could do it at a youth group to say, you know, like, hey, I've got, I got to show you something or whatever. And I, I said, uh, there's, there's this book and I said, this is a book called Catholic for Reasons. It's this thick. He's looking at me like, mm, I ain't going to read that. You know, this is a military guy. He's like, keep it simple. And I'm like, it's a collection of different chapters that are all standalone. And everyone is on a different apologetic topic. Would you read one chapter? Yeah, sure, yeah, I'll do that. All right, great. Would you meet with me in two weeks again and talk about it? Again, a little more formal because it's mine. Whereas if you say, you know, like, hey, read it. I'm, I'm going I'm to ask you about it next time at youth group. You know, something simple like that. You can bring it across. And so I asked about it. And so two weeks later, he came back. And he was freaking out. He was like, that's amazing. I had no idea. You know, it's so awesome. Like, you can prove right there from John 6 and from 1 Corinthians 12 that, like, it's in the, it's in the Bible. I, mean, I had no idea that the Eucharist was actually in the Bible. Like, it's right there. I don't know how any Protestants couldn't see this. It's, it's right there, you know. He got so excited. Fast forward the clock. After a conference experience and a mission trip, awesome conversations, etc. He comes back to me at one point. He says, hey, uh, when I was back at, you know, on break, I, uh, I sat down with my parents and I took them through an hour-long Bible study on the Eucharist. I was like, Mom, Dad, you have to understand. Like, I know you, you, know, you, you taught me this, but you've got to understand this from the Bible. And he didn't actually understand it fully from his parents' description that it really was his body and blood, soul, and divinity. He, he didn't know that for sure. And so he sat down for an hour-long Bible study. I'm telling you, man, when you, when you get to experience that, when someone else is coming to you and they're pumped up and they're super excited and they're sharing with you how they just shared this with their folks and how this is life-transforming for them, for their folks, it's like, yeah, I could go for another week, you know? And some of those are even another month, right? But you need those. You need those of fuel that comes back to you, not just the, yeah, everyone experienced had a wonderful time. That's great. But, but I like it. But, but who is going to show up for your kid's baptism years from now in your youth group? Who's going to show up at your graduation if you go to the Augustine Institute or some other master's program? Who's going to come to those life events of yours because they care so much and are so personally invested? Think about that for just a second. Who feels so deeply invested in by you personally that they would they'd come to this or that? If you call it a Bible study gathering at 6 in the morning at school right before it started, or not right before it started, but before it started, who would show up? Who feels so deeply invested in that they would be willing to be kind of crazy or, you know, freakish a little bit. Jesus freakish. You know? I had one teammate, she was, she was complaining to me. She was saying, it's so hard, this one girl, I keep reaching out to her, I keep inviting her to this event, to this event, to this event. And she won't come. 
And I said, well, have you, have you, and she was already a student leader, so she was already like bought into the program and everything, so you wouldn't be weird if you were breaking into her life at that point. So have you gone to a basketball practice of hers? Well, no. Okay, well, have you, have you gone to her study hall? Because you know, minds are always studying. So that's a great way just to buddy up with someone. You just sit next to them for an hour or two, and then all of a sudden the conversation just flows. No, I haven't done that. Basically, I kept asking, have you, have you met her in any way aside from inviting her to, invent, uh, to events? No. At events, have you gotten to know her? Have you, have you really gotten, you know, like, point of questions? Have you gotten to know her interests or what engages her or what, what draws her in? No. Well, then, of course, she's not going to come. Why would she come? Because you have to be willing to be uncomfortable to the point. I think you should be willing to be uncomfortable to the point where someone cannot feel uncomfortable being weird. Because we're all weird, right? We know this, especially youth directors. We all know this. We're weird. We're twisted up inside. We got all this silliness that just doesn't fit together right. We got this God-sized hole in our hearts. You know, we just, yeah, we're weird, right? We're incomplete. We're made for something that we don't have fully yet. And how can someone be weird and just admit all that stuff and kind of lay it all out and kind of explain it and understand it in small group or with you one-on-one -on -one unless they feel like, okay, I can be vulnerable, right? I mean, you guys know this. It's part of youth, youth ministry. If you're, not, if you're not a little zany and a little crazy, they're not a little interested, right? <laughs> you know? You got you to gotta have some crazy, right? You got to have a little bit of that. So that's, it, it's essential for you when you're, when you're going through that uh, to, to have the, the little bit of crazy. Uh, one, one experience, too, so, uh, so engage, engaging someone. I think there are various levels at which you can engage someone. Some people, even just to have a conversation, even just to be able to talk to someone, you know, that's huge. As I mentioned, you know, the, the person that was antagonistic to, to the faith. Um, defending a doctrine and actually questioning someone, trying to get one of your students to, like, okay, mention God. Try to bring him up at some point in school. That's, 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 that's a commitment, right? To just mention God. So let's talk about what were you doing last week, or over the weekend. Well, I went to church, and afterwards I was this awesome youth group, and we talked about this about Jesus. You know, just to even say that's like, oh, that's hard. You know, the first time you did, you just feel freakish, you feel weird, right? But if we're there with them and we're there challenging them, they can do that. You know, then you can invite them to a conference and retreat. Then there are bigger levels of commitment. I mean, someone can simply, you know, and, and directly say, I, I commit my entire life to Christ. Okay, if they're ready, then, you know, then great. And if they're not ready, then just help walk them through afterwards. Another one is mission trip. You, know, you can help them go on a mission trip. But have those ideas in mind. So that I'd say, so as you're, as you're thinking about people, especially if you're praying for a small group of people, you can really think through what they need. What's the next step? Because you can get to see someone there. They were at a three and now they're at a seven. And they're just, they're good and they're solid. Everything's going great for them. But there's got to be something that takes them to the next level. And you're like, mm, it's a mission trip. It's a mission trip to Peru. Christian Life Movement's leading a mission trip to Peru, and they got to go on it. You know? But to always be thinking about that for just those few people, you know, anyone that comes to mind, but, but especially intentionally for those few people, like, how do I get them further? How do I get them to get a little bit more in? How do I love them a little bit closer to Christ? So engaging them. Um, last one, discipleship, is not as applicable uh, unfortunately, in high school as it is in college. Some people can do it. And I was talking with a, with a friend of mine last night. He was explaining that in his youth group, they have people actually go through uh, and, and mentor kids in junior high. If they're volunteer for the junior high, they're able to share the faith. And that's wonderful. If you have that, excellent. But it's hard to get people in high school to kind of get out of their class, you know. And I'm trying to understand this, actually. <laughs> I've been told this, you know. Uh, but I guess I've experienced it, too. I just haven't experienced it in ministry. You know, whereas... In college, to get a junior to invest in a freshman is a really good idea, and it really works. It's a little bit harder for high schoolers. I would say that for discipleship, for getting them to pass this on to others, right, for them, for them to start to reach out, I would still set it as a goal. Even if they don't actualize it for three or four years. When I first met with Craig, uh, we were, uh, one, of, one of the first meetings, I was like, you know, like, I explained what it means to be a student leader. It's like you being prepared to go lead a Bible study. Said, I can't lead a Bible study. I said, oh, no, no, just be willing to grow closer to Christ. We'll take care of the Bible study when it comes. But I still say, stated it right from the beginning. I still put it out there. It's, look, this is an expectation that's long far away. This is kind of where we're heading here. Because I'm telling you, when you can share the faith with someone else, it's going to be so exciting and so awesome. So even with the high schoolers, even just to set that out there, you know, that one day we're going to get there. 
One day you're going to be able to pass on the faith to others. Whether it's junior high kids, whether it's, uh, whether it's high school students, or whether it's in college, where, wherever it is, one day you can get there. To set that objective is so huge. To set that out there already beforehand, before it's applicable, before they're really being called into it. So last, last story for you. Uh, I mentioned a guy named Ben. Uh, ben went on a mission trip, I mentioned, right? He came back from the mission trip, and his younger brother was also uh, attending the same Bible study. And uh, Derek was just kind of a space cadet. Like, he was there physically, in body, every single Bible study. And he was not there at all. <laughs> you know, he was just kind of floating off there. Just, he, he wasn't rude, didn't text, but he just was gone, you know, the whole time. And I remember when Ben came back from his mission trip down to Honduras, he came back and, uh, and Derek walked up to me at one point. He's like, uh, yeah, so Ben, um, he's kind of different. I was like, yeah, you know, awesome mission trip. It was a really good experience. He's like, yeah, yeah, it was. I was like, you want to go on a mission trip? Yeah, yeah, I want to go on a mission trip. <laughs> okay, uh, I got one coming up in Peru. You want to go on that one? He's like, sure, yeah. So he did, and his life was transformed too, and it was awesome. <laughs> it was so cool seeing these two brothers, because the younger brother invited the older brother to come to Bible study. Then the older brother went out and really ran on ahead in his faith, and then the younger brother was like, I, I got to catch up. So I just absolutely loved it. And to see the excitement there, you know, to see the excitement as you're investing in people. And I, and I was mentoring his older brother at that time when he said that. To, you know, to see the, the, awesome, the awesome fruits of that and to experience the joy of Christ and others that are learning Christ, going deeper with him and eventually passing them on to others is so good it's worth all the efforts. And please do not feel guilty if while you're able to maintain your other duties, you look for a few people to say, I really want to love a few people closer to Christ. And I'm willing to, whoever's, whoever's there, whoever God presents, this is not my, me picking, this is God picking, whoever God brings into my life, I'm going to recognize it, and I'm going to go for it. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, let's stand up for a prayer.